Hallelujah. Right, are we ready? Let's start with Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. We are going to be learning about faith today. And I know that the best that we can do in the time that we have, the best we can do in the time that we have is to introduce the subject of faith. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 8. It says, Now the just shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. Now the just shall live by faith. Now the just shall live by faith. The reason why this topic faith is very important is that God expects that everyone that is called the just, everyone that has found salvation, everyone that has been bought with the blood of Jesus Christ, that has been washed, God expects that your daily lifestyle should be a lifestyle of faith. Faith is not an event. It's not something you do when you need something. Do you get the point? Sometimes we don't wash it 24 hours, 7 days a week. 365 days a week, we don't worship. No matter how you know, good a foodie you are, you know, there are people that are foodies, right? They love eating food. And there's this documentary about a man that all he does for a living is to go to different countries and just try delicacies. He has eaten raw meat, he has eaten lizards, he has eaten, he's just a food. He loves food. But that man, no matter how much he loves food, he does not eat food 24 hours in a day. Food to him is an event. He does it once in a while. Maybe after two hours, once in three hours. The Bible is saying in Hebrews chapter 10 that the just shall live by faith. It is not supposed to be an event. It should be your daily lifestyle. That is how important this faith is. That God expects you that everything you need, just like you drop in oxygen, just like you draw in oxygen, even when you are sleeping, you are still breathing. That is how the lifestyle of faith should be to everybody. The just shall live by faith. Okay? Now, faith is meant to be a lifestyle, not an event. Why is faith so important? Are you with me? Are you writing? Why is faith so important? Do you know that they are... I think Theodore said Jesus performed 37 miracles. And 19 of them were to individuals. Individuals, apart from the miracles of feeding the 5,000, raising the dead, calling out Lazarus from the tomb, the one on one, you know, miracle he performed, 16 of the 19 required the faith of the people. 16 of the 19 one on one miracles Jesus performed required the faith of the people. So you will hear Jesus will say something, Go, your faith has made you go. It means even Jesus Christ, even Jesus Christ. Jesus requires your faith for him to do something for you. So this faith is very important. Jesus requires your faith to do something for you. Another reason why faith is so important, if you look at the book of Luke chapter 18 verse 8, we can put it in the Passion Translations. Luke chapter 18 verse 8. Jesus had told the parable, a story of a persistent widow. A persistent widow. I'm not making this thank you. Jesus had told the story of a persistent widow in the book of Luke, chapter 18, verse 8. And uh, he said something in verse 8. If you don't have it, you can just put it in the King James Version, and that's what you have, so that we can read together. Why faith is so important? I tell you, he will grant justice. To death quickly, but when I, the Son of Man, return, how many will I find who have faith? How many will I find who have faith? If I read the Passion's translation, it says, God will give sweet justice to those who don't give up. So, so be ever praying, ever expecting, in the same way as the widow. Even so, when the Son of Man comes back, will he find this kind of undying faith on the earth? You know why this is important? Jesus' concern is that when he returns back to the earth, not that will he find people that are rich, not around with being rich. Will he find people that are prayerful? There will be people that will pray. Will he find people that are 
that worship us. There will be people that worship. His greatest concern was that will I find this kind of faith? You know why? He understands that faith will be the most attacked phenomenon in your world with God. If the Bible says the just shall walk by faith, if Satan can influence your faith, if he can attack your faith, your whole day, your whole lifestyle has been implicated. Yeah. And so he was saying, Oh, when the Son of Man will return, when I come back, will I find this kind? Will I find faith? Faith will be attacked. Faith will be redefined. Faith will be given another meaning so that the believer does not. No one that Paul told Timothy, Paul told Timothy in 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 12, to fight the good fight of faith. Fight. Fight the good fight. There are not many places in the Bible you will see the Bible will say fight. Even when it comes to the enemy, the Bible says we should resist the devil. We should resist the devil. But when it comes to that thing called faith, faith, the Bible says you should fight. And it's called a good fight of it. Lay hold on to eternal life. Go on to that. Paul has professed a good profession before many years. Fight. It means whatever you need to do to make sure this faith is intact, do it. Because your life, the beauty of it, or the non beauty of it, notwithstanding, is dependent on your understanding and your implementation of this faith. Don't Jubilee. Faith is that important. Faith is that important. Now, I and my wife were talking the other day, and we said that the whole theme of the New Testament, if you were to summarize the whole of the New Testament, what would it be? The theme. Do you know that the answer is grace and faith? Grace. The whole of the New Testament. If you can understand these two things, grace and faith, you will be balanced. Grace provides something for you. Faith makes it yours. Grace provides salvation. There is requisite faith to make everyone saved. And so you see the Bible says that the grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. The grace that brings salvation has appeared to all men. But not all men are saved. Not all men are saved because there is need for a permanent faith to make that salvation to be personal. No matter how much you know that I have in God, and I want you to listen to me, because we believers, one of the things why that is the biggest dilemma of a believer is that we do not know what we have in God. We do not know how much God values us. We do not know how much God has given to us. We are not ordinary. Yet, even if you know, it is possible that you know that I am the owner of this estate. You know that I am in charge of this country, yet it is not yours because you don't want to appropriate it. It's like saying that um, I have a, a car to give to the child. The child, legitimately on paper, the car belongs to the child. But if the child does not know how to walk a car, operate a car, drive a car, that car is legitimately the child's and yet the child will not use that car for anything. Grace may provide. Grace may provide, but faith is needed to make what grace provides you. It's like, um, it's like, you know, if you look at Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, the Bible says, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3. It says, Who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing? Ephesians chapter 1 verse 3, yes. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. Now, many believers love this scripture because it speaks a lot about how God has blessed us with every spiritual blessing, all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. All. But the, 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 the dilemma of this scripture is that it is in heavenly places. Grace has provided it. Jesus has done it all. Jesus has paid the price. All things are yours. The Bible says when he came out of the grave, when he went to ascend, he said, All powers in heaven or earth has been given unto me. All powers. He has given the key to the church. But, he, but even though he has given it to the church, not everyone operates in that power. There is need to understand how to appropriate 
is lost in heavenly places. It's like having an appliance in the house. You have a TV, you have a microwave. In fact, something interesting happened. In the last month, we had a retreat and we had guests that came from Nigeria. How many of you were there? It was an awesome time in God's presence. And so the first time we went to pick the guests, you understand, from the airport, we wanted them to come to our house. Come eat first, you know, relax before we take them to their hotel. And so something happened. When we brought them to our house, something was wrong with our fuse board, and suddenly there was no power in the house. So there were food there, there was a microwave, there was a refrigerator, there was a TV screen, there's air conditioner, there's ball, there's light, everything you need in the house is in the house. But we could not use any of it because there was no power. That you can have all you need in this life as a believer, but in that electricity, that power is not there to give it life. You will have your microwave and you will eat your food cold. Faith is what gives it life. What I'm trying to establish is that faith is very important. Faith is very important. You can't go through life just being on the fence about what faith is. You can't be on the fence about what faith is. So the Bible will say something like in 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. It says, For whatsoever is born of God, 1 John chapter 5, verse 4. For whatsoever is born of God overcomes the world. And this is the victory that overcomes the world, even our faith. God's boldness in the midst of the corruption in the world. God's confidence that even though they've changed the nomenclature of many things, we don't know the definition of marriage anymore. There's so many things that are out of place. There's so much corruption in the land. There's so much decadence in the land. God's boldness that you overcome the world is something called even our faith. This is the victory that will overcome the world. Imagine God with his superlative form of wisdom saying, This is the victory, not these are. This is the victory that overcomes the world, and you are going to battle not knowing what faith is. It's like going to a war front, having a gun. Eh? You carry a gun, you don't know how to use a gun. And then you get to the battlefront, and you know that, well, I just need to, you know, just shoot the gun. And then you realize that it's not a gun that you shoot. It's a gun that perhaps you use fingerprint. But if you don't know the mechanism of that weapon, and you're already on the battlefront, you, you will suffer. You will suffer. No wonder the Bible says, my people. My people. My people, they perish for the lack of knowledge. If God thinks that faith is important, if God thinks that it is the victory that overcomes the world, you need to fully understand what faith is. Don't joke about today's teaching. I'm just trying to introduce. Don't joke about today's teaching. I once taught, you know, in our online Bible study on the putting on the whole armor of God. You know, as a believer, you need to understand the place of each of the animals that God has given to us to put on. And then the Bible says in the book of Ephesians, verse 16. Ephesians 6 verse 16. Ephesians 6 verse 16. When it came to the act of faith, the Bible used the word above all. Are you with me? Are you with me? The Bible had talked about the helmet of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, the belt of peace, getting your feet ready with the gospel, to preach the gospel. The Bible has talked about all this, this armory. It now said, above all, it means if you have righteousness, if you have salvation, if you have the gospel of peace, what about all? If you have all this weapon and you don't have this one, you are still not complete. Above all, taking the shield of faith, where we each shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wind. But you know a lot about faith. You are still more secure than someone that knows a lot about righteousness and nothing or little about faith. You would need faith to even know about righteousness. 
above all, taking the shield of faith. What is this faith? What is faith? I know, I know that you know, for just nomenclature sake, sometimes the word faith, F-A-I-T-H, is used to de denote the religion. You know, you know, even in the Bible, sometimes when you see the word faith, it's used to denote Christianity or the, you know, the faith, the religion, is the sect of people. Back in the day, they were asking, what faith are you? It means what religion do you belong to? So that's not the faith I'm talking about. I'm going to define the faith that I mean now. Okay? In the book of Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1, and if you can put it in all, all the scriptures, if it can be in New King James Version, that would be lovely. Hebrews chapter 11 verse 1. Now, if you're writing right, okay? If you're writing right, I want you to fight sleep. I want you to fight distraction. I want you to fight, listen to me. All what I try to do at this early phase is just to describe why faith is important so that you now listen. I haven't defined faith, we haven't talked much about faith, but now I just wanted to get your heart ready for what we're about to talk about. If faith is this important, it is important to you. If faith is important to God, if God thinks faith is important for every believer, don't joke with the knowledge. Okay? Right. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Now, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. Let me read how the Passion's translation puts it. It says, now faith brings our hopes into reality and becomes the foundation needed to acquire the things we long for. It is all the evidence required to prove what is still unseen. What is still unseen. Amplified Classic, if you have that. Amplified Classic. It says, now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things. Thank you. Yes. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Hebrews 11 verse 1. Right. Now faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title deed of the things we hope for, being the proof of things we do not see and the conviction of their reality. Faith perceiving as real fact what is not revealed to the senses. So all we read, are you with me? Say amen. 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 Can you repeat after me? Amen. 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 All right. Please shake off the tiredness, shake off the boredom, shake off the sleep, okay? Um, Hebrews 11 verse 1 says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for. The substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. And if the first thing you will note here is, it says faith is the substance of things hoped for. Meaning faith is not the same thing as hope. Faith is not the same thing as hope. Hope talks about the future. I hope that when I get home, there will be food for me. I hope that when I eat this food, I'll be nourished. I hope that with this degree, I will get a good job. I hope, I hope, hope talks about something that is going to happen in the future that is very, very pleasant. I hope that it's going to rain today and cool and the weather is going to be cool. I hope, I hope, you might not know what it is now, but you hope. You hope that it's going to be cool. I hope to graduate someday. I hope to, for some people that are not married, I hope to get married someday. I hope this, I hope that. Now the person faith is the substance of what you hope for. What is substance? When the Bible says faith is the substance of what you hope for. And then the Bible says it is the evidence of what you still do not see. It is the evidence of what you still do not see. You don't know what tomorrow is. What is your guarantee for today? You know, you know there are certain people that, you know, their fathers would write, I don't know what it's called, but like when you turn 21, there's, a, there's 20 million dollars in the account for you. What is it called? What is it called? And the father write until you turn 21. Trust fund. Trust fund. Now, a person of 18 years, he's 18 years old, and he has a trust fund waiting for him at 21. And the person knows that I may not have 20 million dollars right now, but I know that when I turn 21, there is money. 
some were waiting for me. And I don't know, there's a, there's a, I don't know, in the band or something to show proof that when you go to anyone, just come with your birth certificate to come to show that this is you, and then this one will be yours. Even though the person is not physically holding the 20 million dollars, that certificate or that, that birth certificate, the fact that this is who he is, is his confidence that there is something good. It is the assurance that there is something good. The Bible says, faith is the evidence of what you don't see. That you can hold something now, and it is the evidence of what you are expecting. I used to give this example. You can bring it if you want to bring it. I used to give this example that if you are hungry now, and you have a debit card or a credit card, and you're hungry, that debit card is not food. So the, the debit card is not food, right? Yeah. But if you know that, well, I have at least a hundred dollar in this card, I do. If I take this card to a restaurant, I know for certain if I order chipotle, I will have good food to eat. And so even though I am hungry, why I am not in despair? I want to be fed, I want to be fed, but I have something that is not food, but it is a substance that this God guarantees whenever I want food I have it. So the Bible is saying, faith is the assurance, the confirmation, the title thing of the things we hope for, the proof of things we do not see, the conviction of their reality, that even though I don't see it, it exists. God is saying this is important. Without faith, it is impossible to please God. Please pay attention. I'm trying to read the really definition so that you understand it. Faith, faith, faith is the substance of things you hope for. It is good to have hope. Everyone should have hope. Everyone should have a good future in view. Everyone should want you know something good for their life, something good for their business, something good. What is the proof? What is the assurance that it will come to pass? What do you have today that is your boldness to face the uncertain tomorrow? God is saying faith is that thing you have now. So faith is always in the present tense. What do you have now? You know, God does not have a tomorrow. You know that, right? God does not have a tomorrow. Sometimes when you speak to God, if your faith is, you know, you know one of the foremost teachers of faith in this 21st century is Kenneth E. Lee. And he says, sometimes he prays for someone and he lays hands on them and he prays for them. And he said, Do you believe you are healed? He said, I sure hope I am healed. And he said, You are not healed. You, because that statement is suggesting that they are hoping they will get healed. I hope I will get healed. Now, that statement already negates the prayer of faith that I have been made. You need to understand the dynamics of faith. Because God does not have it to know. Everything is now, the present. What do you have now? Your own assurance for your own tomorrow. It is called faith. It is called faith. Okay? How does faith work? How does faith work? You know, how does faith work? The first thing I want to say, if you can write, how does faith work? The first thing I want to say is that faith is a law. Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Faith is a law. Romans chapter 3, verse 27. Faith is a law. It says, you can go back to the New King James Version, but this also works. It says, then what becomes our pride and our boasting? It is excluded, banished, ruled out entirely. On what principle? On the principle of doing good deeds? No, but on the principle of faith. If you read the King James Version, it says, where is posted now? It says, it is excluded by what law? Of works? No, by the law of faith. Why is this important? It says, faith, by the law of faith. Why is it important? A law is not subject to your feelings. The law of gravity does not know if this person is a baby. If, if a two-year-old baby jumps off a two-story building, 
The law of gravity will not say, oh, this baby does not know me, she's too young. No, it's a law. A law is independent of your feeling, of your desire, of anything. It is so. It's a law for you. So the Bible is saying that faith is a law. It's about the law of faith. You should understand the principles that make it work. Have you heard anything concerning? 
concerning me. This is not what God said to us. This is you. This is you. God promised all the Israelites, none of them enjoyed the benefit of the promise of God. You have to learn to personalize everything that is in the Bible. And that's why, you know, we encourage people to stay in the place of reading. Paul told Timothy, till I come, give attention to reading. You, the word of God does not become yours if you don't even open it to read. If you don't even come to a place that is to hear, you need to be situated to hear. So you pay attention, you read. And if you read, you study. There's a difference between reading and study. And when you study, you meditate. Now, this is where people miss it. This is where we miss it as believers. Meditation is not yoga. Meditation is not humming and being silent and then doing your hand in the way. No, no. Meditation in the Bible means you repeating the word of God to yourself, watching the word of God on so much till it becomes your own. It becomes your own. I am the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Perhaps I am the right. Me, me, that sinner, that person that was showing that I am the righteousness. You continue to say it until it becomes your reality. That is your boldness to proclaim to even Satan that you are the righteous of God. If you do not personalize the scripture, faith is not present in you. We need faith so much. Faith depends on what you know concerning God's will, not assumption. Not assumption. Don't assume. Don't assume that God wants you to be healed. Are you sure first? Go and search the scriptures. Wait on the scriptures till you a word jumps out to you about your healing. You know, Bishop, there's a preacher in, in Nigeria. He's the wealthiest preacher in Nigeria. He has a large outpost of churches. He's been there for a long time. He said he knows that the Bible says that he's going to make his children, that God is going to make his children prosperous. But even though it is clearly written in the Bible, he himself, who was suffering in poverty, he did not have, the Bible seemed to contradict his life experience. You know what he did? He said he locked himself up in the room, opened his Bible, he got some books on prosperity. He was reading the book, he was studying the scripture, searching, waiting, God, what is the secret? Tell me, tell what are you saying for me? Even though it is your will for us, is it for me? Speak to me. And that he said in, in his story that he got to a point in the Bible where he saw something and he jumped up and shouted, Yay, I found it. That is what God expects. If the world weakens you, can you put it in the old King James Version? Revive me according to God. That if the world will quicken you, that yes, this is yours now. That you, as for you, I am going to establish you there. If that jumps out to you, then you know for a certainty that no matter what happens in the future, you have a substance to go into that future. You have an evidence, even though you don't see it yet. If God, if God says you are the healed of the Lord, if God says you are now restored, you are healed, even though the pain is still there, you have an evidence to say yes, even though the pain is there, I, I know for a certainty that He has said. Do you trust God? That's the truth. Do you trust God that you trust that His word is true? If that is the case, then you should wait to hear his voice. When you are sure he has spoken, that is all you need. Faith starts when you have heard. And hearing can be determined by the word of God. Number two, faith is different from belief. We're talking about the principles of how faith works. Faith is different from belief. Faith is different. I may believe. The, the major difference is like two sides of the coin. It's similar. It's similar, but it's different. Now, if I give you a car key and ask you, do you believe that this car key can turn on that car? You will say yes. You will say yes. If, even though you believe it can turn on the car, if you don't go and physically you know, turn on the car, your belief is correct. Your action if it's not corresponding to your belief, even though you believe, you will still not enter that car, you will not enjoy the benefit of that car. That they are nutritionists. Nutritionists that know about the effect of nutrition, the diet, they know about all this. If they don't act on their knowledge to eat, a farmer somewhere who does not know anything about vitamins, 
to your proteins. If the farmer is eating, the farmer will be nourished. Now, you may believe in something. You may believe that God wants to heal me. There is the faith component in that belief is the action you take. Right. Faith is different from belief. The action associated to your belief is faith. Now, your actions is expressed in number one, your confession. What you say. What you say. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. New King James Version. 2 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 13. New King James Version. Your action is revealed in your number one, your confession. Your confession. He says, and since we have the same spirit of faith, according to what is written, I believed and therefore I spoke. We also believe and therefore speak. Listen to me. If you believe it, if you believe it, it is not is a law that you will speak it, you will talk, you will not be quiet. You don't believe that it just stays in your heart. Even salvation, that's where the heart of believes, with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That there is need to, to confess what you believe something, say it out loud. And confession, do, do you believe that you are healed? If the word of God has jumped to you about your healing, and, and I know that someone here is going to be healed today, I don't know who you are, of eye problem. If you have a problem with your eyes, you're going to be healed today. If you believe that, you think you're going to be healed, right? Now, there is necessity that there is a confession that follows your belief. Now, that confession should be, can be rooted in two things. Number one, the confession should be rooted in also the word of God. You don't just, you don't just, you don't just confess. People can be weird. That's why God puts guidelines to this. Someone can be confessing that I killed Pastor Shea as my wife. Pastor Shea is already married to me. And they are they believe as much as belief can be. They believe it. They believe it. And so the confession that you make should be in accordance to the, to the word of God. The Bible says that this about me. The Bible says he will make all grace abound towards me. Me having all sufficiency and me abound to all good. Therefore I believe that I will have all sufficiency. I will not be poor. The Bible says that I will be like a tree planted by the rivers of water. the word of God. Don't just confess. You know, I talked about, talk about how the difference between belief and faith is the action. The action you take. I'm saying your action can be revealed in your confession. It be text that you need to confess. Now I'm saying your confession should be number one, deep and rooted in the word of God. Don't just confess. Don't just confess. Use the scriptures to confess. And then number two, your confession can in your past victories in God. Your past victories in God. When David was in front of Goliath, he did not quote scripture. He said, the God that delivered me from the bear, that delivered me from the lion, we also hand this Philistine over to me. His confession was based off of his last victory. Sometimes, when you are confessing confession of faith, right, what you can do is say, God, you that brought me here to the U.S. There are some people that it was a major prayer to get to the U.S. You that took me through college without debt, you that did this for me, you are still able to do this. Your confession now is based off of past victories. It is important. Your faith is not faith, it is not acted. It's just a belief. You need to act. And your action means you need to confess. You need to confess. Now, the second part after confessing is you need to act in correspondence to your confession. Now, I, I will explain. I will explain. If you are trusting God for a child, and Brother Sam, yeah. his name is John. Mm. Yeah. Your first son, his name is John. Yeah. Mm. And by this time next year, you will be celebrating your soul. Yeah. Yeah. While I was praying, I saw you, that you were dancing, because his name is John. Yeah. Yeah. Now, faith demands 
that now that you believe in this belief that there is an action you need to take. Go and start buying things. Go and start preparing the room. Faith. I told you, belief. You can believe and not act upon it. It's not a faith. The action. If you truly believe it, start acting upon it. Start acting upon it. You know, my wife. There was a time that a prophecy came upon her that you're going to have an international ministry. She was in Nigeria. There was nothing like going outside. But the prophecy came. You know what she did? She went to apply for an international passport. Faith demands that you act. I talked about confession. You can confess and confess and confess and confess and not do anything. Remember, faith without works is what is dead. If you don't do a corresponding action to corroborate your confession, it will just be a confession. If David has said, "The Lord has delivered me," you know, from the day of the Lord will also give me this uncircumcised vision, and did not throw the stone. If he did not throw the stone, it will just be a confession, and nothing will happen. To ask him, what is it that you are not doing? Even though you believe, even though you believe, there are some people that can even he was bedridden for how many months? Eleven months or so. He was bedridden for a long time, you know. And then he always would read the scripture, read the scripture. You know, he believes he has been healed. He believes he has been healed. He continues to read the scripture and confess and confess it until he then he said, "Let me try and get up myself." Until he acted on his belief, I want to get up. Was still alive. You need to get up. That's my point. That you have been sitting down waiting for something to, to jack you up. No, 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 no. You need to get up. You need to do something if you truly believe. You need to act. You need to act. If you are believing God for strength to pray, you don't sit down and like God and waiting for the strength to come. You first get up. Act that you believe that. God has heard your prayer, you're not going to act, act. You're believing that you are healed. Start doing the things that someone that is healed will do. Action is necessary. Okay? Yeah. Now, number three, you know, I talked about um, the first point I made is that faith comes by hearing. The second point is that faith is different from belief. Now, and then I talked about how belief, belief can be expressed in your confession. And then the corresponding step, you need to act to show that you really believe. Now the third thing in that belief is that you need to give, if you truly believe God has done it, you need to learn to give glory to God. In the book of Romans chapter 20 verse 21, Romans, Romans chapter 4 verse 20 to 21, Romans chapter 4 verse 20 to 21, if you can put it in the Passion Translation, that would be lovely. If you can put it in the Passion Translation, The Passion's translation. Yes, thank you. It says, he never, talking about Abraham, he never stopped believing God's promises. He said, for he was made strong in his faith to father a child. And because he was mighty in faith and convinced that God had all the power needed to fulfill his promise, Abraham glorified God. Listen to me. If you are waiting to have, I don't know how to say it, there are people that have been trusting God for something, you know. If you are waiting to have that thing before you can dance, you know, some people used to say, the day I get my green card, I will jump. You know, people say that. The day I get my citizenship, I will dance. Or the day I hold my baby, oh, I will roll on the floor. Oh, I will do this. If you are waiting for that to happen, you are walking by sight. Abraham started giving glory to God before, before the child came. That belief demands that you start praising God, let's start thanking God, despite not receiving it yet. Dance now! For the day your wife steps on Arizona, the way you will react, the way you will thank God, start thanking God that way. That the expectation you have, that you are trusting God for, if you believe, start giving glory to God in the state that you are praying in. Some of you see yourself as millionaires, businesses, well established. You, 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 you envision that this is what happens. As if you are not that big seed. Start thanking God. Do you know what that does to God? You are glorifying God. You are thanking God for your baby. Oh, I said, look at how handsome he is. Or how beautiful she is. Or look at this business. Look at my warehouses. Look at this. You are thanking God. Not thanking God. He gave glory to God. He gave glory to God. This 
someone also that you don't wait till you see it before you thank God. My friend, he went for, he applied to come to Arizona State University. And um, in the past few years, he had not accepted anyone on that scholarship. So he applied for the scholarship. And so the decision was not out yet. So he went to the church. And he said, does anyone have a testimony to give? <laughs> he raised his hands. He said, what is the testimony? He came up. He shouted, John, praise the Lord. Hey. John shouted, yeah. John, even his, his uncle, that he lives with his uncle, was like, what, what happened to him? I, I don't understand. And so he came up and said, you will not be what happened to me. There is this prestigious scholarship that I applied to in the United States. It is so competitive. It's so hard to get in. And in the whole Nigeria, I was the only one that was accepted. And people, everyone shouted. The pastor jumped up his feet, came down and bored in. I'm like, guess what? He had not seen the scholarship. He had not. He had not seen the scholarship. A few days later, this show came out. And he got it. He went for a visa interview. And when he came back home, the people asked him, How did he go? He shouted, Glory! And everyone, oh, thank God, finally. Oh, glory to God. He went for a shout, Praise the Lord! Glory to God! He was so excited to see his face was bright and happy. And so people said, Oh, praise God, he went left. So people asked him, Why would you leave? He said, But you did not get the visa. You know why he was shouting and jumping and shouting? This time he did not get it. He knew he had heard God say, I will take you to the universe. Yeah. It's only a matter of time. He started giving glory to God in denial. Amen. When my wife, she wanted to come to the US, and we, she went for this interview, I had prepared her as much as I can prepare. These are the questions that we can ask. This is how you answer. Everything we had done, the documents, everything was full. Everything was ready. They denied her. The mood was down. Even no matter how anointed you are, if there are certain news that just brings you down, you could tell it affected her. It was down. Guess what? A few days later, she spoke to her spiritual father. And her spiritual father said, when something like this happens, and you are sure God said he would take you to the US, he would give you an eternal mission. Start giving glory to God. So, you know what she did? She turned on the music. It was like one hour prayer session, and she was dancing in the room. Just by herself, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of that disappointment, he went that God take you because I'm in America. He was dancing and dancing and dancing, and when that day passed, the following day she came in, she put music in, and I she was dancing. She said, Why she was dancing? She heard a voice that said, Go and check the rejection sleep. She went and opened the rejection sleep, and she saw that actually you can reapply anytime. So I can reapply them, and she reapplied again. And then, surprisingly, she got another date just a week after she applied. And then the second time she went for the interview, you can imagine her body was shaking. They were already denied it the first time. You are coming back in less than one month's time. They were already denied it in the same location. In fact, the woman that denied her was just there. The woman that was just there. So I remember that because I was with her that day. I was trying to sing a song.
Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. If you can put it in the Passion Translation, Second Corinthians chapter 4, verse 18. Faith does not ignore what does not deny rather what is seen. Because we don't focus our attention on what is seen, but on what is unseen. For what is seen is temporary, but what is unseen, what, but the unseen realm is eternal. We don't focus our attention. We don't focus. Now, faith does not deny what is seen. Faith only denies that you don't allow what is seen to dictate your life. You don't deny that the pain is there. You just don't allow the pain to dictate your life. That even that despite the pain, you still do what you, you would have done if the pain was not there. Faith does not deny the sin. It's, it will not be faith if I go out there now and I want to cross the road and I don't look at the traffic light. Because since faith is evidence of things not seen, if I don't see anything by faith, I want to, no, faith does not deny what is seen. You can see. You can see what part of life. But we are saying that faith does not deny it. Faith demands that even though you see something, you don't allow it to dictate your life. That you don't see the money. You don't see the health. You're still in pain. Yet you don't allow the pain to detect to detect your life. And so you remember the story of even Abraham. The Bible says that in Romans chapter 4, verse 19. It says, and be not weak in faith. Romans 4, 19. Be not weak in faith. Romans 4, 19. Be not weak in faith. He considered not his own body now dead. When he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. The Bible says he did not consider it. He knew he was dead. He was not in denial. He was not in denial. He knew that at a hundred years in this, but I said he did not consider it. He did not consider it. Do you know, you know, we're all adults here. There are certain people, if they were in Abraham's shoes, there's no even need having sex anymore. What is the use of having sex with Sarah? Her womb is dead. Not allowing the obvious to dictate the action. He considered not his own body. Some people, you are weak, don't consider the weakness. You know it's there, don't consider it. You know the pain is there. Faith demands that you don't consider it. You know that the difficulty is there, you don't consider it. You act. And so when you see people that go, I am the witch of the Lord, you know they are poor, they are not considering what they are doing, you know they know. Do you understand? Faith dictates the demand. Look at the story in Matthew chapter 14, verse 30. Matthew 14, verse 30. Peter, Peter was walking on water because Jesus said come. He was walking on water. Matthew chapter 14, verse 30. Then the Bible says, when he saw the wind boisterous, he was afraid and beginning to sink, he cried out. He started walking on water. When he took his eyes off Jesus and saw the boisterous wind, that's when he began to sink. Did he not know that the wind was there before? He knew, but he refused to allow the wind to detect his action. He was going to step out of the boat despite the wind, as long as his eyes was on Jesus. Faith demands that you, even though you see the wind, even though you, you don't allow it to detect your action, to detect your action, man, that you are still going to get off the boat because your eyes are on Jesus. Don't look aside. Don't consider. Take the step because you have heard the word. Are you with me? Yes. All right. All right. Number four. Don't deny your feelings, but don't, don't deny your feelings. Take care of them. You know, I put a note here and say, don't deny your feelings. Take care of them. If you have a headache, take care of your headache. Uh, or fix your eyes on Jesus. There are people that they are so on the extreme of faith that they don't even get the it. They don't get killed around because they believe that they are the righteousness of God in Christ have been perfected. Why do I need body below <laughs> There are people that have gone on that extreme. Faith does not deny, does not, you know, you don't deny what is there. You need to take your shower, you need to apply lotion because your skin is, you need to eat. You don't say, I am perfected and then I will not eat. You need to eat because you, your body needs it. If you are sick and you are professing faith, right? Sometimes the root of that sickness is not the headache. 
The root of the sickness is something else. It's the need to take care of the headache with Tylenol. You take care of it. As long as your eyes are still fixed on Jesus the healer. Do you understand me? Do you understand me? There are people that they don't even have health insurance because they believe. Do you get my point? It's just the same thing as not having, you know, you know, uh, a, a, you know a deodorant because you believe. The deodorant is there to suppress, to help you, to help you. So also the health insurance is there to help. Because your faith may be intact. What if someone else out there is driving reckless? Can you control their action? What if they come and hit your car or hit you? And you are okay, but they help you, or maybe you have a scratch and you don't have a health insurance. Take care of yourself. Number four. Number four. One of the principles. The principles of it. Faith calls things that are not as though they were and not the other way around. Romans chapter 4 verse 17. Romans 4 verse 17. Romans 4 verse 17. You can put it in the KJV version. Romans 4 verse 17. KJV, thank you. As it is written, I have made thee a father of many nations, before him whom he believed, even God, who quickened the dead and called those things which be not as though they were. This is important, especially in our confession. Some people confess wrongly. The Bible says, Faith calls those things that be not as though they were. It's not faith calls those things that are as if they are not. It's a difference. Faith calls those things that are not as though they are. Faith does not call things that are as though they are not. What I mean by that is, if you have leg pain, faith does not say, I do not have leg pain, that would be lies. Faith says, I am healed. You are calling that thing that is not as though it were. You are not calling those things that is as though it is not. Does that make sense? It says, and call those things which be not as though they were. So when you are confessing, you don't say, I am rich, or how do I know? I am not sick. I am not sick. Uh-huh. I am not sick when you are sick. Uh-huh. If you are sick, if you say I am not sick, that is lie. Uh-huh. Even that you say I am the healed of because at that moment you need to call those things that is not as if it were. I am the healed of the Lord. Uh-huh. I am the healed of the Lord. Uh-huh. I am the healed. So it does not deny what exists. Uh-huh. You are calling those that be not as though it were, and then you are acting. It's a principle. Now, I wrote here in my notes how to measure your faith. How to measure your faith. Because God is not partial. God does not show favoritism to any man. Okay? Faith, we all start in the same measure of faith. Romans chapter 12, you'll see that in someone in verse 3. God has given unto all of us a measure, a measure of faith. He has given unto all of us a measure of faith. But there are some people's faiths that are great, there are some people's faiths that are small. How do you know where you are? Because the danger is this. We have someone that is into fitness here. If you have not never deadlifted 500 pounds, you've never done it. Right? And then you go to the gym and say, I want to try to deadlift 800 pounds. Right? You want to do it now. You will hurt yourself so badly. That there are people that they are fit, they are trying to exercise a 800 pounds level of faith when they have not started with 10 pounds. How do you measure your faith so that you don't move beyond you? There's someone back in the day I read in the book where he believed that he's going to go over to that village to evangelize. But there is a river that separates his own village from that village. He said, Jesus walked on water. I'm going to walk on this water and go there. That's faith. It sounds radical. Does it not? It sounds my good. Yeah, that's it. And you know what he did? He jumped inside the water and drowned. It is important you know the level of faith that you currently have so that just like that person in the gym, you don't go and start with 800 pounds. You don't start, <laughs> do you get my point? You don't start with 800 pounds. You start with 10. And if you're comfortable with 10, you know, consider that you move to maybe 15 and then maybe 20. And then someday, maybe two years down the line, you cannot try 800 pounds. Your body has adjusted to it. That's how God deals with us that way. You don't start from that point. Please, I want you to come to the school of argument. 
we meet Saturdays, every Saturday, 3 p.m. Because there's so many things that I want to talk about this faith, like there's the gift of faith. There's something about the gift of faith. That the gift of faith is different from just this faith that we're talking about. That someone, if you have the gift of faith on you, then yes, you can start from 3,000 pounds. It is called the faith of God. You know, Jesus looked at the disciples, you know, I've digressed if you understand. When he looked at the fig tree and said, No one will eat from you again. And the following day, the fig tree was dried up. The disciples asked him, Look at the fig tree that you cursed. And Jesus looked at them and said, Have the faith of God. That was the faith of God. So, Patricia will put it, Have faith in God. But it is the faith of God. If you have that faith, even as small as a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, Be removed. That is the faith of God. It is a gift that God bestows to certain people, not to everyone. What Romans chapter 12 verse 3 said that God gave every man a measure of faith. How do you grow this measure that is given to everyone so that you can exercise it to grow? There are people that have this gift of faith. If you see the way they operate, you will feel that God loves them more than they love. How many of you have heard of Archbishop Bexley? Is one example of someone that God gave what is called the gift of faith. He, if you are driving him, I heard, you'll be scared for your life. You know why? It, go to 100, go to 200, 120, man, just be driving fast. He is safer on speed. <laughs> that you, you would be, go, 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 and you'll be, you be scared. You are scared. Why you? No. His own kind of gift of faith, he has once thrown an airplane that if you don't carry me, your safety is not guaranteed. And that is true. He can, he can command a plane. He's that aggressive. He has kicked dead body back to life. If you try it, you get my point. If you try it, he has, that's a measure of faith that God gave you. God gave you a gift of faith. Now that is a dimension of faith. We're going to talk about all this, right? But this measure of faith that you have, where are you? Where are you? You know, Jesus once said something. You know, when, when the disciples they looked at Jesus, they told him, Lord, increase our faith. It means that, that this measure of faith can be increased. And Jesus looked at them once and said, Oh, ye of little faith. Meaning that your faith can be little. And there was a time that one of the centurions told Jesus Christ, You don't need to come to my house. Just speak the word. I am also a man under authority. And I said to my servant, Do this, he does it. I said to the other one, Do it, he does it. Well, he was amazed and said, Have I, even in Jerusalem, I have not found such a great faith? It means that a faith can be little, and that little faith can be increased, and a faith can become a great kind of faith. Now, how to measure your faith, number one? Do you know that the first way to measure your faith is in your finances? If you've not trusted God that you will survive, if you give 10%, your time. If you not trusted God and survived by giving 10%, then your faith is too small. Finances are one of the smallest ways to exercise your faith. If you never exercise your faith in your finance, the Bible talks about tithing. If you've never given your tithe consistently and you're constant and you don't suffer and you don't go hungry and you don't starve, then your faith is no longer on number one thing. But if you are still struggling at that, then this meeting is for you. Start to tie. Tithing is a rudimentary way to measure your faith. Number one. And I wrote in my note that do you believe that if you cast your bread on water so you see it after many days? It's a measure of your faith. That it is your money. If I give a good of it to God, I will not starve. It's a determinant of how God will trust this God. That God will help. Some people don't. It's hard earned money. I can't know, no, no. I, I, I have a friend. The truth is that if you do all the life, and this is what I earn, this is what my wife earns, this things, if we remove 10%, we will not have enough to take care of everything. So he was giving. 5% or 2%. That was the measure of their faith. 
it was a day that he said it was a church and he heard the voice saying, You've been stealing from me. I said, Give me ten. If you cannot trust God that God can keep you alive, that because you obeyed him, then your faith is too small. That's the truth. If you cannot trust that God will keep you alive, God will keep you alive by giving 10%. Your faith is too small. I know God is challenging someone's heart that from today, you can put it at the duty that yes, I will give God my, my 10%. You know, some other principles, financial principles that we ignore, things like what is called, God was chastising me. What is called your first fruits? We don't practice such anymore. Back in the day, first fruit, I remember the first paycheck I ever earned as a teenager. I took it and I went to my father and I said, Daddy, please take it. The Bible says we should honor God with our first fruit. And I'm going to honor my father. He's, he's, he has been born over me. He has been a priest over me. And I'm honoring God to him. I said, Take, this is my first fruit. We don't do that anymore in the body of Christ. The Bible says, Honor me with your first fruit. He looked at Jesus when Jesus asked him, Do you believe? 
He said, I believe. Help my own belief. Help my own belief. I don't know where the unbelief is in your heart. I don't know what it is that is still hindering you from believing full scale. That there's something that is a reason for doubt. Maybe it's repeated failures. Maybe it's repeated failures, repeated disappointments that is not making you to believe anymore. You just said, now, yes. I want you to say now, Jesus, help my own belief. Help my own belief. Help my own belief. Is there something that my faith is not big enough because of my own belief? Lord, help my own belief. Help my own belief. Help me, Lord. Help me, Lord. Help my own belief. I don't want to doubt. Oh, I don't want to doubt. I don't want to doubt. I don't want to doubt. Help my own belief, faithful Father. Help my own belief. Help my own belief. Help my own belief. Lord, I pray. Can you pray for yourself? If there's something, there's something, there's something a hindrance to you believing full scale. Maybe the repeated failures. Maybe the repeated failures. Maybe the failures of your parents. Maybe the failures of your siblings. Maybe something. Maybe your own experience. Maybe the difficulty of the economy is 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 affecting your belief. Can you say to that, Lord, help my own belief. Lord, help my own belief. Lord, help my own belief. So that I come again and I believe that I'm going to act.